this is Jared Mursky and my homie Chance, Chauncey, uh, Leopardi, uh, AKA Squints, yep. uh, from uh, the cult classic, uh, we all know and love Sandlot. And also most recently, that Logic music video, which was fucking awesome, by the way. <laughs> This is Rebranding Cannabis. I'm your host, Jared Mursky, and you're listening to the show that helps the industry grow. Hear from industry titans, thought leaders, and the up-and-coming founders of this multi-billion dollar industry. Presented by Wick and Mortar. I've got a question for you. Uh, what was it like being part of such an iconic movie? Um, it's just a blessing, bro. Like, to see... Anytime you do a project, film-wise, you never know what to expect from it, you know, regardless of the hype around it when you're shooting it. Things don't always mm-hmm. translate from script to to feature. So um, you never really know. We know we had a really good summer and it felt like a lot of fun, but you don't know that you're going to be here 25 years later talking about it and that it's going to continue to to grow in, uh, you know, cult iconicness, I guess. I mean, for lack of a better word, but... Uh, it definitely turned into a cult film following and it's been shown to multiple generations of kids and continues to to travel that way which is as grassroots as it gets you know and it's a blessing it's really cool now i i listened to a couple interviews and i i remember hearing uh you know one of your um producers talk about how as a kid you actually had a lot of swag oh yeah yeah, yeah. you had to kind of (laughs) you had to kind of put on this nerd this kind of nerd dorky look, and that wasn't actually who you were. You were apparently the, the, the kid with the most swag of all 13 kids. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's debatable. I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna go out there and say that, but ain't much changed. I'm always kind of been into fashion and ahead of the curve on that type of stuff. And uh, I come from a, a hip hop and LA background that is, you know, definitely has some you know, I'm a gangster rap baby, so what you see is what you get, I guess. Yep. So I, I recall, uh, I recall a time um, during the movie where there was some some pretty memorable lines. Uh, I think my favorite one was "forever." For I just I I can't tell you how many times I think I've said that in real life, just as mimicking the movie. <laughs> but what was your all-time favorite line? Hurry up, Benny. My clothes are going out of style. <laughs> that, was my, that was my favorite line. There's so, so many. How is, there are, and there's so many that I hear people say on a regular basis that originally stemmed from that movie. When you uh, took that role, was, uh, were, you, were you actually wearing glasses or is that something that, like, is that, do you not wear glasses? No, I don't. My eyes are good. Um, I wear them indefinitely now, though, for all types of appearances and other things. But uh, (laughs) no, it was just part of the character. That was the the role squints. And uh, they had me start wearing those those frames. And uh, it was cool because it added like all of the flair to like the character because he's always like, you know, pushing his glasses up or rubbing them on the shirt and putting them back on. It always adds that like flair of things. And I mean... I think that is part of the iconicism is that those square black frame glasses is what everybody associates with that, that era, you know? Um, yeah. That's the glasses that everybody associates with wearing in the sixties, even the military glasses, the prison issue, all of them were the same square black frame. That was like the standard glasses. So it gives it that, that much of that, uh, that iconic Americana feel to it. Do people just see you outside and just go squints? I mean, I live in L.A., so, you know, the unwritten rule is to not bother people in L.A. as long as, you know what I mean? Um, But I have it pretty easy. Like, I'm not the guy that gets chased down the street. Patrick, the redheaded uh, kid from the film, played Ham, he can't go anywhere. And in L.A., it's not that bad, once again. But, like, when we travel to do things elsewhere, like, he gets, like, literally cornered places and chased (laughs) down the street. And they scream out of cars at him and stuff. So he definitely gets it. So the... The, the fan, the fanhood is there. It's just not directed at me. I kind of like, I kind of go under the radar a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's because you've still got the swag and and, I look different. He still look exactly. You do. You still look the same. 
I mean, I, I look, I I look different, but I don't look different. But at the same time, he he still looks. I mean, there's no mistake in that. That's that's Pat. You know what I mean? There isn't like, yeah. oh, I think that this is this guy. People just stare at me because they think they know me from somewhere. But they can't quite put their finger on it. Yeah, it's a lot of like we went to high school together, or I went to, I remember you from so and so, or you look really familiar, or that type of stuff. But it's not necessarily, um, yo, you were squints. But every now and then it is, yo, yo, you were squints. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does happen. <laughs> yeah. And and you did you went and you did a lot of you played a lot of other roles uh, after Sandlot. Um, I think you were in a what, a season or so of Gilmore Girls and. You did. Um, I mean, there was a bunch of different stuff that you were on after after Sandlot. Was there anything, you know, that you felt like was promising? Or I mean, I mean it seems like you because now you're in the cannabis industry, and it seems like you're not doing a ton of acting anymore. But I'm just kind of curious, you know, what happened and how that transition. I've been selling weed since I was a little kid, and ah. and uh, so there's no transition. I mean, I've kind of been with the shit my, my whole life, so it's just. The business is transitioning. I'm not transitioning. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the business has transitioned into like we get to talk about it and you get to know who's the legal market. Yeah. Yeah. Who's really who and whatnot. But like we ain't we ain't been, you know, I've been around the game since I was a little kid. Um, and when I say little kid in my teenage late later teenage years, you know, uh, so I after did Sandlot. act. Yeah. Yeah. Long after Sandlot. Um, but uh you know, I was still acting at the same time and doing stuff. Um, I kind of lost interest in it in my like early 20s, early to mid 20s. And it's always a weird transition for a child actor going into adulthood because it's different and the business has changed. And it was also a weird time in the business because it was transitioning between um, film and digital. And uh, I kind of lost interest in the business itself because it's it's a whatever business as far as I'm concerned. I mean, what's it? I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like being a child actor. I watched Justin Bieber's like, a, you know, um, his whole series. And he talks about, you know, just how lonely it is at the top being so young and so popular. I, yeah, I could only know, imagine that what movie. that kid what that kid had to go through, because I was like a whole nother level of fame. Once you get to that, it's scary. You know what I mean? And then you wonder why people isolate themselves and have compounds. Um, because one, it's a security risk. Two, you know, they're creating a ton of, of income for a lot of different people, not just themselves, but a lot of people are eating behind that and that business. And I feel like they don't really get to, to live their true self, you know, and uh, it's a shame and it's scary. Um, mine wasn't as bad. I obviously kind of got to be one foot in and one foot out. So it definitely had its its upsides. I mean, I say that, but don't think that, you know, it's not all bad yeah, either. No, Obviously, it. Justin's gotten to do things that none of us will ever, ever be able to do in our lifetime. You know what I mean? Because of his fame and the amount of joy that he's brought to so many people. Um, but it does come with the other side of that coin, which means that you don't get to, to move around normally. It's funny you say that because... Mm-hmm. Uh, The guy that directed the Logic video is named James Larice. He is a video director that does, he's done a lot of M stuff, um, M and M stuff in the last 10 years. And he was telling me stories about how Marshall has like a a long beard and long hair right now. um, (laughs) And uh, people don't recognize him. And it's like the first time in his life in like a really, really long time. I mean, in, in his height, he would have to do prosthetics just to go to the mall in Detroit to buy his kids Christmas presents. Like he would literally do prosthetics and people would still figure out that it was him. And that's just him moving around like normally doing normal day to day type stuff. So he has, he had been riding his bike around like his old neighborhood and shit in Detroit. And just like Marshall's just out there by himself riding his bike around. And he's tripping out on it because like, because he looks different. It made me think that um, during this COVID-19 thing that celebrities are probably living their best life moving around a lot more freely than they used to because everybody got a mask on and can put a hat on and some glasses and kind of uh, nobody knows who they are. If you think you do, you don't really mm-hmm. know. You know what I mean? Can kind of mm-hmm. uh, the, mask, the mask thing can go both ways, I guess. Because I, I, I always funny. see like pictures of, of like Leonardo DiCaprio out in New York or somewhere. And a lot of times you'll see celebrities and you'll be like, damn, maybe they don't look very good in this in this this picture or when people see him out and about and i always have to think like oh he's trying to look bad because 
They dress homeless on purpose. Yeah, he doesn't want people to pay attention to him. You know what I mean? Because if anybody sees, yeah. I mean, they're going to chase the dude down the street. It never ends, you know, once it gets like to be a thing. Like, can you imagine the amount of pictures that, that Leo would have to take if somebody knew it was him? And then you're an asshole, when you, you're an asshole when you say no. Like, you literally can't, you can't say no to people or like, you know, shame on you. Yeah. Well, because you want to be a nice guy. Of you know, course. You want to be... You want, you want to support your fans, but I mean, when you're that big and you're so far at the top, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, I can't even imagine what it's like. I have, enough, I have a hard enough time walking through a cannabis conference without people asking to take pictures with me. I can't imagine what it's like in like real, real life. <laughs> yeah, it can become, it can become, I mean, it's obviously flattering and, and then, but at the same time it can become uh, overwhelming and scary and, and all types of emotions, you know? Yeah, it actually, for me, and I'm sure this, it was the same for you, even more so than myself, but I almost felt like my, my personality was, tr was starting to change a little bit. I was becoming less social than I used to be because I was now at a point where I was having way too many conversations, and so I was just getting completely drained. Of course. What was that like for you? Um, it depends on the day, but uh, I'm pretty good at just uh, conserving my energy in that way and not not engaging necessarily when I, when I, when I don't feel like it, you know, it's tough, yeah, well, but I, I a agree. a lot of time to practice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the film grew in popularity as time went on and then technology has kind of caught up to that now. So I feel like now is probably the most relevant that this thing has been, which is crazy mm -hmm. to think that, you know, it's more relevant 30 years later than it is when you did it, but that's yeah. kind of like what has been unfolding in front of us, you know? Yeah. So I, I watched an interview um, where you mentioned that Matt Kemp uh, had said that he started playing baseball because of how inspired he was watching, you know, your movie. That must have been pretty overwhelming given, you know, you're a huge Dodgers fan. Yeah, it was dope. We were on the you field. Know. I have a really good uh, uh, boomerang of it um, on my Instagram. You have to send that to me. Yeah, and it's a boomerang of like him giving a hug to one of the dudes in front of me um, when we did the Sandlot night there at Dodger Stadium. But yeah, he told us that, and that was dope because he's a, a super cool dude. And obviously, I love Matt Kemp, and I'm a huge Dodger fan, but he's a really, really likable, nice guy, like down to earth. And uh, yeah, he said that that was one of the reasons like he was inspired by the film to kind of start playing. And, you know, I'd like to think it's true, who knows, but at the same time, it was, it was really nice to hear from him. I mean, I... I think your movie inspired me to play baseball. Um, it inspired my brother to play baseball. I know you follow him on, on Instagram now. He's one of your, your big fans. But yeah, I mean, watching that movie, it, it, it just, it's just one of those movies that just never dies. And, and what's kind of funny about this is I, I, was, uh, um, I heard and, and have seen uh, some of the Sandlot diehard fans. And I know that you have a few yourself that actually dress up as you. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty big Halloween costume. Uh, Wendy and Squints are a pretty big couple's costume. So everybody does a Wendy and Squints thing. Yeah. So I'll get a lot of athletes and a lot of uh, celebrities and different things. So it's always fun around October to see all the Wendy and Squints pop out of everywhere. And then see people dressing up their little kids. And it's really cool. It never gets old. So many Sandlot-themed birthday parties now. And just like, uh, I just, I follow the hashtag squints on Instagram. So yeah. in my feed, I just get an endless amount of um, free content, but also, uh, you know, inspiration to see that, you know, this character is still like inspiring people to, you know, spend money and dress up like, like that person. It's, it's pretty cool. You actually have a very squints esque yep. shirt on right now. You it got the cool. baseball shirt on. I know. I, uh, my brother brought it for me just for this. Oh, okay, cool. Just for this uh, interview. Yeah. Yep, yep. He's like, hey, do you have a baseball shirt? I was like, no, actually, I don't. He's like, I got the perfect one. Yeah, that's the one. That's so. the look right there. It's the, you know. Yep, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I already know this, but uh, because, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a fan of yours as well, and I, and I did some, as much research as I could. Wendy, tell me what that was like, you know, I realized she was your first kiss yeah. and many people may not know that, but she was your first kiss. And that must've been so 
uh, stressful as a as a young t as a young kid having all of these cameras and this huge audience watching you, and then and then this writer like feeding you lines, then telling you not to slip the tongue or you'd get fired. Tell me what that was like. I can I can't even imagine. <laughs> Um, well, well, from what I hear, I was super excited about it. So I just kept, I kept jamming <laughs> David Mickey Evans, the director up like every day about it. And then he finally came to me one day and was like, yo, today's the day we're going to shoot that scene. And it turned out that it was like, we we're shooting in the summer in Salt Lake city. And, uh, it was freezing cold that day. So in the pool, you can see a lot of us shivering because it was like, it was cloudy and overcast. So it was really cold. And, uh, that didn't help, you know, things, you know, it's cold. It's not, not really, uh, not really feeling your best, but, uh, I think I stepped up to the plate. I think that's very symbolic Literally. for, for Squince's, uh, you know, character is like, you know, the kid that, you know, did the borderline creepy thing, but at the same time kind of knocked it out of the park and it's a beloved m moment because of, uh, she smiled Every kid at wanted him. to be you. Yeah, it was like... Every kid wanted to be you. Exactly. <laughs> it was a very wholesome, sneaky thing. But uh... So what's ironic about the fact that you have these diehard fans that like to dress up as you is, you know, you actually, for the first time, got to dress up um, as someone you're a diehard fan of, Logic. And, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, I watched the music video again last night, and... I know you mentioned that you're a huge hip hop fan and you've actually been a, a fan of hip hop since you were just a young kid. Um, do you, do you actually rap at all no. yourself or, okay. I mean, because I rap in the car. You, I know the, I, I know the <laughs> lyrics to like every rap song ever made probably, but um, it's really easy for me to remember and pick those things up. So that's, that came natural to me to like lip sync his uh, stuff. And no matter how fast it was, like I got, I can keep up with it and follow the rhythm of it, but it was tough. Now I, I did that. Mm -hmm. I did that real, real time. So um, all the hand movements. What was it? What was it like sharing the stage logic. with Logic and Eminem? And I mean, I don't really that? know. I sh I don't really know. I shot it by myself, so um, they kind of pieced it together. But it was really cool. I mean, it was obviously oh. an honor. We were never in the same place at the same time. We shot it all oh, separately. Shit. So I actually didn't uh, wow. see M or or Bobby when we were doing that. Um, I've still never met Bobby, actually. Oddly enough, he called me after we got done doing the film and was like, yo, um, you know, thanks a lot, blah, 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 blah. And we've been trying to catch up or get together at some point, but our schedules haven't really uh, lined up properly. Well, shit, that needs to happen. You guys need to do another music video. That was awesome. And I thought it was it's so hilarious how close you guys actually look to one another. Yeah, it is pretty wild. And that's, I mean, that's how the whole thing started was from that meme that he put, he posted that somebody had made of like, you know, squints turned into Bobby or turn into logic. Um, and uh, that's funny. it is pretty fitting. That's, that is pretty fitting. So all of this stuff has now kind of helped you, uh, I, I think, you know, build a name for yourself as well as a personal brand. But how, is, how have you been able to use that to help uh, grow your, your cannabis business? And, and tell me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I'm a cultivator by trade, but I come from a, a really well-rounded background in the business. Uh, I ran retail and micro businesses prior to just being into cultivating. So I have a very balanced background of the whole space because I mean, at some point during the Prop 215 days in California, we were the whole space, you know what I mean? In a sense, it was, yep. there was no brands on the shelves. It was, you know, owner-operated businesses that were, uh, you know, the lifeblood of the industry. Um, I feel like the squints thing is definitely, you know, once I made that more public, I mean, I got people that I've been working with for years that didn't know that that was my background. Like, they literally know me from the shops I used to run and and... <laughs> and uh, at some point they would figure it out and be like, damn, I did like, what the fuck, you know? But uh, I think that it opens a lot of doors in the sense of people are willing to, you know, it's like the same thing that we find with social media now that when you're familiar with somebody, you feel like you know them and you've known them for a long time because you get to watch their life from afar and, and uh, you're kind mm -hmm. of included in that. And with Sandlot being such a big, a big thing and such an Americana type of uh, cult classic, it makes people really comfortable with the fact that in a, in a weird business, because this is, remember, this is, 
you know, all of the prominent figures in this business were criminals, like, you know, not too, too long ago, they were doing this, you know, semi illegally, um, in the eyes of, you know, local and, and federal law enforcement. And, uh, so I think it makes it very easy for me to cross over and for people to know that, you know, this is who this person is and I trust it. It's also really cool that I feel like I've known him forever because I grew up watching this film. And then um, it's it's cool that it bridges gaps. Like I'm from Southern California and I come from a, you know, a uh, we come from an indoor warehouse background of cannabis and we don't really intermingle with the Northern folk that often outside of the ones that we directly did business with when we had retail stores. And it's cool to like be able to go to a show and meet all of these guys or through Instagram and go up North and uh, chop it up with the, the other culture up on the Hill up there that people, you know, that outsiders aren't normally welcome into. And uh, it's nice to, to, it's nice to be able to combine everything together and, and really help build a brand based off of, of friendliness and help and, and love where as people don't necessarily see me as competition, but they want to see like the homie do good. And, and, uh, that's, that's, you know, it's a blessing to, for people want to share with you and share information and and share space. I think that's, Mm -hmm. you know, the most important thing in, in any aspect of life is being welcome and, and valued, you know? Yeah. Well, I like, you know, what you did that I like is that you didn't turn your brand into a celebrity brand. You're not, you know, you're not a Chong's Choice or a Willie's Reserve or Marley's Naturals or a, you know, Leafs by Snoop. Um, you know, you're, you're your own brand and you're not necessarily trying to leverage your likeness as a way of creating more influence. You're trying to build a brand based off of substance and foundation that is built you know, not instantaneously, but over time. And so I love the fact that you've taken that approach to that. Um, tell the listeners a little bit more about your brand and, and how they can learn more about that as well. Um, well, a group of us have a brand called Foreign Genetics, and it's a group of growers from the Southern California area. And uh, um, Foreign is, is definitely the focal point of the brand. Um, my personal brand, Squints, is a... Uh, a derivative of that. And I feel like more so of anything that I'm involved in, it kind of has a, a piece of the squints name to it as well. So it'll be a lot of collabs between, you know, whether it's the homie Zach Woods and, and for genetics and, and squints brand, I'll definitely have mm-hmm. some, some personal strains that I'll run um, under my flag. And then a lot of it will be pushed through the foreign genetics name um, as well. And, uh, I think that foreign genetics is, is kind of a, it embodies Southern California lifestyle. And all of these guys that are involved with that brand definitely come from the, the beginning of the business in the late nineties and early two thousands and started from growing in houses and working their way up to warehouses and, and, uh, garnishing license and, uh, and, uh, turning into a legitimate, you know, a legitimate brand. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that we try to just, we try to show it from a, a standpoint that this is kind of our life and this is kind of what we have been doing regardless of what people have seen or not, you know, but this is, Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of like the SoCal grower industry lifestyle in a sense, you know, and we like to work really hard and have a good time and, you know live a, a foreign exotic life in a sense and smoke good. And we pride ourselves on quality and that's really what it means. I mean, we want something that we can stand behind at the end of the day. And, you know, regardless of in the, the storefront of the streets, I think that our, our brand holds a lot of value, mm-hmm. you know, in the way that we conduct ourselves and the quality that we try to keep with the product and what's not, what not. And so, you know, you being an experienced grower and cultivator, uh, you know, you obviously understand, you know, the importance of, um, you know, quality over potency, right? I think there's a big misconception that, uh, you know, the more, the more uh, potent the product is, the higher the THC, um, the more, ex- you know, the more valuable it should be when in fact that's not the case. Or it yeah, be. I mean, it doesn't make it, it doesn't translate at all because a lot of the strains no, that I'm, test super high are terrible. 
<laughs> yeah, and they and, and they just pull the and they just pull it straight. You know, the, the they just test the cola. I mean, I like to use the example of like um, Everclear and Belvedere, right? Yeah. Everclear is a hundred proof and tastes like shit and will surely give you a hangover and is less expensive than Belvedere, which is, uh, you know, uh, I would say a far more superior brand and product. Um, tastes better. It's more smooth. It's less potent, but it's more expensive. Exactly. Well, you're buying, so, you're buying the, you're buying the mix, you know, yep. uh, with cannabis as well. I mean, the market's so new to a lot of people, so it doesn't really make sense to them, but I've always known that from buying product for the shop that, you know, some things look good, but don't smoke good and things that don't smoke good, they're not going to continue to be around the market. And, you know, OG is the, you know, the crown jewel of the industry and she kind of built it in my opinion, and she tests like anywhere between 25 and 26% like regularly an accurate THC test, but she's by mm -hmm. far stronger than, than any strain on earth over time. You know what I mean? There's no, been nothing to hold that relevance for a longer period of time. And any true smoker is going to go back to that over and over and over and over again, that, that mm -hmm. gassy thing. And mm -hmm. then we start to find out with all of the terpenes and things that are going on these days as things get more scientific that maybe that flavor has a little bit more to do with potency than, than we gave it credit for previously. Right. So, yep. I mean, smokers like to smoke gassy strains for a reason. Well, gassy strains get us medicated <laughs> and lack of a better word, you know, and the fruitier it is, the less medicated it's probably going to be. And sometimes the most pretty calyxed, uh, crystally, a flower is going to be very bland and not really lacking in flavor. And I think that, I think that we're coming around because people are flavor chasing now and the whole, the whole water hash movement, rosin movement and kind of terpene like chase. We're starting to breed differently based off of what we know is actually true now, instead of chasing THC percentages and certain, you know, look, they used to breed for red hairs in the seventies. So we lost, probably two decades of breeding to something that was just inaccurate based off of scientific, scientific thing. It was something that somebody said, yo, this is Panamanian red hair, or this is whatever, you know what I mean? And like, we know that I wouldn't want uh, a nice top of flower that was just solid in hair. I mean, that's, that's a sign of, uh, of deficiency and, and inconsistency as far as I'm concerned in a flower. So, as things progress, we will know more. And as more money um, in the colleges and in these other countries that are willing to test for medical research, and the more that we genome and map the genome of cannabis, the more that we'll learn and the, the easier it'll be for us to really isolate compounds and, and use the plant to its full potential. We know that it's, you know, in my mm -hmm. opinion, the most it's the most useful plant on earth. There's nothing that can be as versatile and there's nothing that's flavor palette is as versatile. I mean, to people that don't smoke, they don't know that, but, but it's the most yeah. versatile terpene profile on earth. There's no other thing that tastes in so many different ranges as cannabis. No, no other plant on earth has that big of a range and wide of a range of flavor. Well, let's talk about the science a little bit because that's an area I'm obviously very fascinated in as it relates to building products for, companies, clients, and market segments alike. Um, I've got equity in a company called Melix GX where we can actually test your 101 of your genetic markers to determine which terpene profiles make the most sense based on your genetic makeup. Exactly. So we, yeah, so to your point, the science behind uh, what strain specificity will essentially help from a medicinal perspective, um, consumers and patients alike yeah. more, con more consistently. Um, and then there's another technology you may have, you may or may not have heard of. Um, the machine's called the Lacy. It's Lacy Tech, but it's made by a company called Harvest Direct. And um, what it does is, you know, as you know, when you decarb cannabis, right? For everyone who doesn't know what decarb means, it means to heat cannabis. The, so you heat up the, the the molecules. It's when it becomes activated. Hot, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. So. Um, you know, you light a joint, you roast a bowl. Well, what happens is you actually lose like 70 to 80% of the, the strain's original profile, which means those effects that you're buying, you only get like 30% of, if that. maybe. Yeah. If that, yeah, exactly. if that. And so, and so when we talk about packaging and, and strain specificity as it relates to the intended experience, 
when we work with clients, you know, we, we try to use words. So like if it was a, if it was a brand that was focused on video game players, right? Rather than using the name of the strain, which most consumers don't know what the fuck means, right? We'll say like play, pause or reset, right? Yeah. Three, three terms that could quantifiably uh, lead a consumer to a path that helps them better understand what the intention of that strain is without being too, too specific, yeah. right? Because we don't want to, we don't want to, um, lie to the customer because again if we know about this decarb thing and most consumers don't well we don't want to be dishonest especially as a new brand or an aged brand um, because that information will start to surface yeah of course so what are you doing with your company to help protect uh not only the strains but ensure that con consumers are making better choices when it comes to purchasing your product over others i mean we we chase we chase the trends of the industry and we're really chasing my my palate as a smoker more than anything is because I'm always trying to be on what's next, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that's just a natural chase of me chasing terps and wanting what's the next, the next best thing. Like I really enjoy cannabis because of the flavor of it and I like smoking, um, but I enjoy the, the depth of the, of the smoke and I'm definitely chasing a high, but I'm also chasing a flavor and I'm chasing something that's well-rounded. So with cultivation, you always want to stay ahead of the curve by, you know, either breeding yourself or um, trusting trusted seed breeders that that is their business. Um, a lot of people don't know, but breeding and testing and even popping and, and hunting phenos from seeds is it's a very time consuming and costly process, especially with the taxes and everything involved in a licensed cannabis uh, grow you know, a lot of times it doesn't make sense to, to, you know, map off this amount of space for, for testing new strains and things like this, because it really hurts the bottom line. Um, yeah, I, I think that as, as the business develops and things mellow out a little bit, we will th see people that are doing things that are really cool, like, um, hunting and then opening these hunts up to the public um alien labs does that a little bit which is really cool um mm -hmm. those guys like to to you know do a random drop of, of a hunted pheno that or maybe something that they know isn't going to make the production cut and is going to be around for this limited period of time there's so many things yeah. that uh as a connoisseur i would love to cultivate and keep but in reality, they don't make sense production wise and they're not going to end up being in our stable for a very long time because, you know, maybe the plant is too finicky or it's uh, not a big yielder or it's mold prone or it, it, it just doesn't make the cut for a production facility. But smoke wise, it could be incredible, you know, and mm -hmm. we find that usually the, the lower yielders are more dank and more kind bud and they, you know, it's sad, but. Uh, people stop running them because they're not as, you know, financially profitable. And this business has yeah. very small margins that, you know, most people are unaware of at this time. But, you know, a lot of these. I'm glad you brought that up. These, these big I, businesses and these companies, they're not they're not making money. They're losing money like like a startup Internet company was back in the day. They're burning. You know, you've seen the burn rate and you hear about the MedMens and the Ignites and all of these companies. And and these are big funded businesses these businesses and and a lot of these smaller brands that people are the boutique brands that people are familiar with i mean these aren't even really brands on that level these are just a couple of guys that have been running this business either cultivators or or people that ran shops and it's really tough for them to like keep their doors open day to day let alone you know to look forward to things in the future because it's a very unstable time still well, and that's why, you know, when I, when I do a lot of consulting for people that are looking to get into the industry who don't have a ton of capital, you know, I often recommend, you know, building a brand and licensing that uh, IP and those products, whether it's uh, a specific formulation or genetics that you have, but essentially licensing that through other existing licensed cultivators so that you don't actually have to touch the plant nor own the manufacturing facility where your products are purchased, but rather manage quality control and uh, assist in distribution. Um, obviously the marketing and the branding is something that we then do for the client, but a lot of companies like to do that then internally as well, because they, they actually really have the financial advice. resources. That's really good advice. That's a really good, good, uh, 
I don't know if you should continue to give it, <laughs> but it, it's, it's really good advice because uh, they don't want to be involved in a lot of the day-to-day -day operations that go on. I mean, they're time consuming and, and expensive and there's a lot of room for human error especially if you don't know what you're doing and uh it is not an easy business by any means i mean anybody that said that uh no that farming was easy is crazy you know and it's 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 really not i mean you're, you're <laughs> dealing with so many different things on a daily basis especially indoors that you know yeah it's very easy to to head in the wrong direction and fall off a cliff um yep. i think that for anybody wanting to get into the space either investing in investing in people that are going to live this life and continue to live this life and that the community can respect um, is a good idea. And I think that, you know, creating a brand, obviously brands have value and, uh, you know, attaching, uh, focusing on something that a cultivator maybe doesn't focus on. And then you guys can have a relationship that is very, uh, you know, a lot of synergy there between somebody that wants to go to work and be a farmer and then somebody that wants to, to build a brand and do all those things because it's very few of us that can manage both. Well, yeah, and I think the biggest issue too is that um, I, I, there's a huge lack in differentiation. So I look at like RX Bar as an example. They sold to Kellogg for $600 million. They didn't own the manufacturing facility their products were made in. They just owned a great brand, a great formulation and had national distribution. Yeah. Imagine having national distribution in cannabis, but because national distribution only exists through licensing deals, no one has a brand in every single medical and recreational state as far as THC is concerned because they most likely own a facility, which is a huge, huge burden financially. So it prevents them from being able to enter into all of these states much faster. Of course. Um, and so then you have the issue of differentiation. Every brand that comes to market wants to be everything to everyone. They build one name with every single product under the sun, um, hoping that consumers will develop or become more loyal to that brand because they offer so many products when in fact, um, Stop. you know, studies show that it's, it's worse. It's bad. You need to be niche focused. you you know, you look at Hershey's, they have the Hershey's bar, then they created Hershey's kisses because they wanted to develop a seasonal product. Uh, but that went so well that they kept it as one of their hero products, but only promoted it more so during, you know, Valentine's Day and Christmas and so forth. But then they also got smart and realized, well, shit, Hershey's isn't bought by every type of consumer. So we should build and buy other companies. So Almond Joy, Kit Kat, Reese's, what are all of these products made with? Hershey's chocolate. What is chocolate made with? Milk, cacao. So when you look at the formulations, right? As it relates to, you know, THC and perhaps an edible or, you know, CBD, um, you know, people need to be thinking not only about how to build equity in the brand itself, but in the IP that supports the foundation of the brand. So if Hershey's chocolate is the ingredient in Hershey's products, what is your special ingredient? Right? Yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, stick to what you're good at as well. I mean, we grow flowers. That's what we do. When people ask me about, you know, they want roll-ons for their ant or, uh, <laughs> you know, different topical products or this. And I'm like, I grow, I grow cannabis. Like, that's what I do. You know what I mean? Like, I can get you that from somebody else or I can, I can find it for you or point you in the right direction of a product that I trust. But that's not my field. Like, I don't plan on making an all-inclusive tincture topical lotion bomb, smart you know bath line or this and that like i grow flower that's what we do that's what we've always done that's our product um i don't even i don't even want to focus on doing concentrates or anything outside of our lane like i'll do collabs with companies that uh that i trust and respect that want to do collabs with us based off of our flower or or our product that they want to either roll their type of of product or their type of concentrate you know I love doing things like mm -hmm. that, but as cultivators, that's, that's what we do. We cultivate flower. I'm only looking to make high end boutique, high end boutique craft cannabis. What are some of the biggest challenges you've had personally, you know, growing your business that you think other businesses in the cannabis industry can learn from? Um, financial literacy is, is the biggest problem for all of us, bro, to be honest. And the lack of business sense. 
in general because we come from a very closed in world where we weren't trying to build brands or put our name on anything because once again, we were scared we were going to get robbed or go to prison or, you know what I mean? Have everything that we've worked so hard from taken from us at, at any point, you know? So now that that is, you know, more of the, more of the lane that things are going and we know that brands are more valuable than the product themselves. I mean, mm-hmm. It's, it's difficult adjusting and I mean, I've been able to do it better than a lot of people because of my entertainment background. So I have a, a understanding of different spaces and those things and have a little social following, but uh, it's still tough. I mean, these guys, a lot of them are farmers, like they go to work every day and they're, they're very technical people, but they don't necessarily have the financial literacy. I mean, most of these guys have been stuffing their money into shoe boxes and mattresses and whatever the, you know, the social thought is on what mm-hmm. you do with the legal money, but they don't, they don't have the financial literacy to learn how to set up these corporations properly. And, and obviously we've, we've adjusted and learned as the two fifteen days got more serious and more regulations entered into Los Angeles. We had to get with the times and lawyers and accountants and, and work with city officials and things are definitely going in the right direction, but that's been the biggest the biggest uh, hurdle is to stay alive through uh, a market that was changing and kind of disappeared and knowing that being in the legal side of the market meant losing money for the foreseeable future. That was challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been challenging to adjust to the COVID-19 regulations that are in place now. I mean, you know, keeping a schedule with social distancing as far as trimming and things of these nature. I mean, facilities have been built to work a certain way and now you just do a curveball so that throws timing off and everything else. Um, How do you prepare for that? That seems like, yeah, I, I kind of want to expand on you that. Don't, you don't prepare for it because you don't know that a pandemic's going to happen. You just, you try to adjust now and, and um, you know, space people out and move a little bit differently. And uh, it takes a lot longer to do anything than it used to. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. I mean, nobody was prepared for that. Yeah, I'd I think be bummed that, uh, if I had to wear a face mask at a growth facility. I'd love to, I, just, I, I, I would want to smell everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's tough working in, in masks. I feel so, um, it's so hard for our, just our service workers in the industry, in all industries. Um, it's not a fun thing, but it's necessary, obviously, for the, the better of the, the herd. So I was watching some guy run down the street with a mask on and he was just sweating. I was like, how the fuck can he run with a mask on? I would just, yeah, it's die. tough. And in, and in cultivating, you know, every room is probably in a different stage of life and every stage of life has a different parameter of humidity and temperature that it likes. Mm-hmm. So a lot of rooms are very hot and humid and wearing completely covered and gloves and a mask and all this stuff at all times is like really uncomfortable. And it's things that there's things that they'll be doing when they're doing de leafs and prunings and running trellis and stuff like that, that you're going to be in there for a good amount of time being extremely uncomfortable. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, it's not a, yeah, before not I a got fun into, fix sometimes. Yeah. You know, before I got into the industry, I mean, well, I've been in the industry for over 12 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, because Wick and Mortar, Wick and Mortar was the first branding and marketing firm in the world, and we started that about 11 and a half years ago. But before I got into branding and marketing in the cannabis space, I was like yourself, you know, doing some illegal growing. And I think it's kind of funny how uh, if you have a if you have a a, a, a criminal record when, as it pertains to weed, you almost get you almost get a pat on the back for that. <laughs> oh, going forward in the business, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what were some of like, when you were, when you were growing, uh, during the illicit market days, since we can now talk about it, um, what were some of the craziest experiences you had as it relates to the risk involved? Um, I mean, personally, I had a pretty charmed life and experience. Um, but I've heard everything, you know, um, from, you know, people getting murdered to, blowing transformers and people blowing themselves up, making early concentrate. Uh, you know, I've known people that have had everything that you could possibly imagine, you know, uh, and you know, there's 
in the early days, there was a lot of stealing of power because it was necessary because, you know, at any time you couldn't have a house with an $8,000 power bill. It was a bad look. And at any time um, that could, could be an issue. Uh, you know, anytime you make something illegal, it brings out certain characters into the space that uh, mm-hmm. aren't the people that you want doing that in the first place, probably. And it's kind of like the whole conundrum of the drug war in general is that by you making this illegal and making the value of it higher, there's still going to be people that are are willing to do it. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you make a gun law that says that nobody can own guns, yo, criminals are still going to have guns. They still make guns. They're still going to have access to them. You know, if you go to somewhere Mm -hmm. like Japan where nobody, nobody is allowed to own a gun, you know, who owns guns, the Yakuza, (laughs) not even the police have guns, but those dudes do. And they're going to continue to have firearms because they're criminals and that's what they do. You know what I mean? They do illegal mm-hmm. activity. So I think that, you know, it's a godsend that things are opening up and we're learning more about it and that people are following regulations because, you know, it's a questionable, scary space when you add a dark element to it. Yeah. How do you think, uh, you know, federal legalization is going to impact the industry? At first or in general? Um, at fir- I think at first and then, and then you know, I think once it's kind of sank in for a year or so, I I, I obviously have my opinions, but I'm just curious to hear what yours are. I think that if they take complete control of it and they separate the local aspect of it, then it'll be a good thing. I think that if they try to continue the situation they have where they have like a local local at the city level and then at the state level and at the federal level, they'll completely squeeze all the life out of the business and it'll be gone because the margins are very thin and it's not going to work with everybody's hand in the cookie jar. I mean, at, at the moment, it's taxed at a rate that is like just unheard of and doesn't make any sense at all. It, does, it, it just what they're asking for is ridiculous. It's a total money grab. And they wonder why the black market is thriving like it is, because one, you make people jump through too many hoops to be involved. And two, what you're asking for is just downright thievery. It's 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 socialist in a sense. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, yeah. I'm all for a capitalist environment, but for you to take half of my business for no reason to do nothing um, is, is uh, that's, you know, that's un-American as far as I'm concerned. You know, I think that everybody should be able to play and everybody should have a seat at the table. I like what Oklahoma did with their licensing, to be honest. You know, I like that it was fair game and that these rates weren't so outrageous. I think that they need to pick what they want. Do you want this absorbent licensing fee and, and all of these loopholes through all of this taxation, or do you want your gross tax off of each sale? But it's not sustainable to hit everything. I mean, you can't hit every side of a business. We can't even write anything off. It's ridiculous. It it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for long-term sustainability. And at the end of the day, it hurts the market because people don't want to play. I agree. It's exactly how I feel about Uber Eats. They swear they've added new, more and more fees for everything. There's like four different delivery fees. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I just want McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Every time you look at it, like a Grubhub, a receipt or something, and you're like, how did, how did a pizza turn into $65 worth of worth? I know. I'm like, this was a $15 meal. $15. How's it $30? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I get it. Um, that's basically what's going on in a sense. And that's what the consumer see. What the consumer doesn't see on the receipt is that, you know, that the product has been marked up double already and that the, the actual cultivator is paying so many fees and packaging restrictions and regulations that it, it's, uh, you know, it's almost insurmountable to, to think that these businesses can not only turn a profit, but keep their doors open in a sense. And we're seeing that, yeah, that the big ones are starting to crumble already with their, with their crazy burn rates and how they're running through capital. And it just doesn't make sense. It's not long-term mm-hmm. sustainable. I, I, I hope that the federal government, when they do become involved, uh, makes a division of the government, you know, that is going to tax and regulate cannabis and that, you know, we can, uh, you know, California, the state had a valiant attempt. The city's had a really hard time and it's so corrupt with the, the way the licensing process went down. And I feel like they did a terrible job. And then in, in the return, it hurt the consumer because the black market prices soared and, and 
the regular market and the dudes trying to do it the right way can't really compete with that either still. And uh, yeah, it was just bad on everybody, you know. And um, at the end of the day, their numbers were off at the state level, too. So what they had projected wasn't what happened because of, you know, people that didn't know everything involved making laws and, and kind of putting their hand in the cookie jar that didn't belong there. Um, mm -hmm. Or the s'mores jar. Yeah, or the s'mores jar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, um, I, uh, I brought some s'mores um, to eat. I know oh, you don't wow. have one with you. I wish I had some s'mores. Yeah. I, um, I highly recommend, this is not like a, this is not like a promo for this brand. This just happens to be one of my favorite edibles ever. These Hanu s'mores. They're so good. And they reminded me of you. So I brought them. That's awesome. Um, so I had, I, I had one before those yet, I called. <laughs> They're only based out of Washington. Okay. Yeah. So see, that's another thing that, um, uh, there's all these great brands that are hidden in markets that, that can't get to the other market space because they're stuck in Washington. And, uh, well, Washington's interesting too, Chance, because it's the only state that doesn't have vertical integration. So everybody's separate. So everyone's separate. You can't retail and you can't, or you can only retail or only cultivate. You can't do both. Yeah. So the landscape of brands is extremely competitive, which was good for us because this is the state we started, you know, the company. Yeah. But it's completely different than other states, which I think is interesting. But to your point, and I think the one that most people are curious about is, well, when federal legalization happens, what the hell are they going to do? And what model are they going to adopt from another industry that they can, you know, uh, uh, use as a starting point or a foundation for this? And because each state has their own set of rules and regulations, it makes it very difficult to develop, uh, you know, you know, a, you know, these uh, rules and regs as they relate to the entire country. I mean, I'm look hoping, at Canada. It's a clusterfuck, yeah, you know, I'm just especially hoping with that COVID. They look at it less as a medical, uh, a Me too. medical business and, and more as an agricultural business. And if that happens, then I think it'll be better for everybody, including them yes. long term. Because at the end of the day, because if it goes scheduled it, too, it is agricultural and it needs to be yeah. treated as, as, as that way, you know? I mean, just the amount of packaging that is involved in it at this point. Remember, in the Prop 215 days, we were very like, deli style service uh, product was displayed in a jar and somebody was served a certain weight or amount of the product into another piece of packaging. And that was pretty much the limit of it. Now they have so many regulations on the packaging size and what you can do and this and that and the small packaging size that people are having, uh, that people are having um, on the shelves aren't lasting mm -hmm. long. You got dried out product that isn't as, as well kept. Um, and it's all due to over-regulation. Uh, anytime you over-regulate anything, it, it, it takes the, it takes the life out of the, it. The, and the fun. You know, the if fun this goes scheduled too, I'm going to be so pissed. Yeah. So pissed. Yeah. The last thing I want this to be is a strictly medicinal product. Um, just because I think it needs to be accessible to everyone. No, and it's uh, not a strictly medicinal uh, uh, product. It does have its medicinal benefits, but it's it is definitely a No, if it went scheduled, if it went scheduled too, then it would be. Yeah, no, I don't I don't want to see that happen either. It's not yeah, just I don't a, medical, a medical business, you know. Now, one one thing that I I feel pretty comfortable and confident saying is that when the cannabis industry does go federally legal, I imagine when border crossing occurs, a lot of these smaller farms are going to be gone because retailers tend to gravitate more towards brands that have a larger amount of brand selections, much like a distribution company. If you're one company and you've got, you know, five or 10 brands, the chances of you and the products being purchased by a dispensary are, are uh, m much higher, pun intended, mm -hmm. uh, than that of a brand that, or that of a company that has one brand. Because if you're if you want 200 products in your retail store, you're not going to go to 200 different companies. It's easier to go to a distributor or a brand that has, you know, a family of brands. So uh, when that starts to happen, uh, you're going to start to see a lot more brands crossing borders with respect to distributing product. So I imagine a lot of these smar smaller farmers are going to be gone unless they can start building their own brand house, if you will. Um, how do you intend to compete with the federal market? I, I don't know how big your facility is, but I know you guys have some pretty great strains and you guys are, um, you guys are selling quite a bit of product, but 
how are you guys planning on approaching the federal um, space, given the potential of what's going to happen in the future? Um, well, I plan to map out the map out the country and see what makes more sense logistically. There's obviously going to be markets that are, you know, more open to us being there for cultivation. And I, I think it'll help long term anyway that we can move the business to other places and cultivate in places that are, you know, more tax friendly or friendly to the business itself or, or logistically make more sense. Like, obviously, you don't want to be transporting product from California to Florida. So you need to be somewhere closer there for distribution. I'm actually excited for that yeah. because I think that it adds to what's capable for a brand to keep to keep consistency in something. You know, Coke tastes like Coke everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, flour is a little bit different. It'll be really, really hard for somebody to duplicate because, I mean, these things vary from room to room, let alone cultivator to cultivator. You know, uh, I think cookies is is having a hard time right now with how far they've expanded. Um, now they're at the point where they've done such a great time opening and keeping craft cannabis in all these markets, but how do you be on top of quality control in so many places at so many times, you know, and a lot of it's out of your hands and you can't put every nug in every jar and every package. It's, uh, you know, I think they're doing a really good thing, but they're coming into a, a space where, you know, there's been some stuff on the internet about, you know, lack of quality control or whatever. And it's, you know, it's tough. Mm -hmm. Anytime that you spread your wings that, that far, it's not like Burner's hand picking every nug going into a jar anymore. It's, it's not, he's not capable of doing that, you know, and it's not his fault. That's just, that is part of, of uh, growing a business and growing a brand. I mean, with the edible recipe, control is expensive. edible recipe is an edible recipe. People have to understand that that it's going to use it's going to use an oil as the 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 product base, and then you're going to make a cookie recipe. So that cookie is always going to be that cookie. It can always be the same strength, mm -hmm. the same the same taste, the same of everything. With actual yep. cannabis flour, there will never be the same same exactly every time because we're dealing with variations and, and things that we can't control, you know? Well, there's, there's some, there are some solutions. So a friend of mine, she, uh, her name is Renee Gagnon. She's based out of Canada. She created a company called TerraCube. Mm -hmm. um, she's also the, she's also the founder of women grow or uh, CEO of women grow. She just acquired that. That's awesome. And, and so TerraCube is like a mini container where you can do small batch grows. Mm -hmm. In a, in a much larger facility where they can all kind of connect. But what it does is it gives you the ability to monitor, monitor um, smaller grows um, so that you can ensure that they're... And the reason why the consistency, first of all, is so hard to, to keep is because when you've got one plant in the middle, another one far on the left, and you've got this big, you know, 40,000 square foot facility, and you've got maybe 4,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet of canopy space where you're growing one strain. I mean, it's, it's hard to give all of those plants the exact same love and attention. But with these TerraCubes, they're, they're much smaller, so you can be more consistent with less flour in one cube. And then that product I was telling you uh, by Harvest Direct, when they use their machine Lacey, uh, what they do is they extract the, the plant, and it, as it goes through the extraction machine, it's called lossless activation, they're actually able to maintain 95 to 100 percent of the plant's original profile. Um, I actually have, I actually have an example right here. So, like this product right here mm -hmm. is, it's a capsule. And if I were to, if I were to take this, this is, um, this is Allen wrench, right? So this Allen wrench uh, strain should be the equivalent to an Adderall That's in terms of the remedy, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but again, it's very few and far between as far as companies using, you know, really, really unique proprietary technology, um, just because again, it's really expensive. Yeah. And so, you, you know, people are like, outside of strain specificity, how the hell do I differentiate myself? And, and how can I be true to the consistency I'm telling my consumers I'm creating? And so I think it's good that, you know, you aren't saying, hey, look, our shit is, uh, always going to be 100% consistent. That's just the way of cultivation. But what you're getting is 
the best damn quality product I can possibly grow because you're putting your own stamp of approval and love on that. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's important. So what are you guys doing uh, as far as social responsibility goes uh, when it comes to your brand? Because that is a huge growing trend and something that every brand should embody. You know, Tree Rolls, uh, a brand that um, our creative director, Derek, uh, you know, built. Um, you know, for every uh, box of pre-rolls purchased, they plant a tree. That's awesome. And so puff, puff, plant. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like that. But um, more and more companies are starting to take advantage of uh, helping more mm -hmm. uh, people in various different areas to also benefit their own business. Um, what are you doing in that regard? Um, I'm, I'll be honest, we're not doing much. As soon as these guys figure out a way to make it like tax beneficial for us to operate like a normal business, and we'll start looking at ways to give back. But at the moment, it's hard to even expand and and to to stay in business as a cultivator um, with everything that's going on legislation and and tax wise in the state of California. It's just the business is crunched, and it's it's crazy mm -hmm. that uh, I mean they're thinking of ways to to make it worse on the environment as far as I'm concerned than, than to help. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think there's a number of things that you can do that are, you know, not cost prohibitive, but, uh, things that you can do as it relates to, um, you know, let's say for example, you increase the, the price of your packaging by, or, uh, the cost of your product by, you know, 25 cents, right? That 25 cents, uh, as a contribution, on behalf of the consumer as it relates to the uh, nonprofit or the, the, the good you do as it you know, pertains to your brand, consumers have, are, are, far, are, are willing to pay far more money um, for brands that support um, nonprofits or uh, you know, any social responsibility um, solution for that matter. So just something to consider. Yeah, definitely, you know, I appreciate we, it. Yeah, we integrate, so we integrate you know, social responsibility into every brand we build simply because we know that the perception the consumer is going to have of the brand is going to be held in higher regard because they are doing something good and people want to support brands that are doing something good. Yeah. So that doesn't true. need to cost you an arm and a leg though. No, I understand. Yeah. I, I totally understand where you're coming from at this point. We're just worried about producing the best quality flour we can and letting the market dictate itself. I mean, Louis Vuitton is Louis Vuitton because of the quality and the branding that has been involved with the corporation for, X amount of years, you know what I mean? You look at it as a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a step above everybody else because of the quality of the product and the, the, the status associated with the brand, you know? So, you well, know, yeah, Louis Vuitton is actually owned by the same company that owns Belvedere, coincidentally. Yeah, um, LVMH. Yeah, they own quite yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. And what's great about them to the point that I was making earlier they don't own any of the manufacturing facilities their products are developed in. Oh, they just own the brands own and the IP. Stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, he actually re he that's, rebranded most of that stuff. He's done an amazing job and created a, a really cool yeah. company. I'm a fan of most of their, of most of their brands, so they've done a, a really, really good job keeping the quality control. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. cannabis will get to that point too. Um, if you don't adjust to the the corporate aspect of it and the fact that a brand is stronger than than any one producer i mean half of the lettuce growers in the united states grow lettuce for mcdonald's there's no other way around that i mean that's what they do plain and simple you know what i mean yep. they're going to grow tomatoes yep. for mcdonald's and that's what they're going to do because yep. mcdonald's buys more tomatoes than than anybody else on the planet probably you know and that's just We'll see that a lot as, as things progress, too, is that a lot of these cultivators will come together and become an organization that produces Florida oranges or, you know, people don't know that mm -hmm. Florida oranges is just a bunch of orange growers in Florida that, that started, you know, uh, a conglomerate of the oranges produced in Florida because they have, uh, you know, for, Florida oranges are better than oranges from other places based off of mm -hmm. regional and uh, different uh Variety. It's like Appalachians. Yeah, it's like Appalachians for wine. Yeah, I mean everywhere. You know? I, I think that didn't Humboldt just get the get the class of it's it's probably going to be the one that gets like the reserve classification for like Humboldt flower, yep. and that being a big deal because it's you know yep. it's naturally in a certain region that uh, is you know more beneficial to the growth of cannabis. 
Yeah, we actually just filmed a documentary on Humboldt called A Humboldt Story. So if you go to ahumboldtstory.com, we filmed a 20-minute documentary talking about, you know, potency and purity and dry cultivation techniques and regenerative farming and microclimates and, and why cannabis grown by these small batch farmers with decades and decades of experience is better than what we see in most indoor grown facilities simply because, you know, again, to the point we were talking about earlier, just because it's grown outdoors and it's less potent doesn't make it any less quality than something that's grown indoors that is of higher potency. So yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, you're still, they can't control the environment as well as we do indoors. So the quality of the product will definitely lack over time. You know what I mean? And then the ability to dry in a small confined space is what the real game changer is. Even if a product out of a greenhouse or outdoor comes out that of high quality, the fact that they're limited on the way that they can store it and dry it and trim it in a timely manner and get it to market is, is the real, is the real trade off in, in quality. You know what I mean? And, and maybe mm -hmm. not potency, but in, in quality itself, but obviously potency Agreed. goes with that, you know? I mean, they grow some Agreed. some really fire flower and humble in greenhouses that is like, you know, comparable to indoor. But the ability to to dry it properly and get it to market in the hills is is you know they're limited on power, they're limited on structures, and it's it's a lot harder for them to to do that. You know, like you said, yeah. we're batch sizes everything in any business when it comes to quality. So the smaller of a batch. The, the better they're going to be like homemade cookies taste different for a reason. And, uh, <laughs> they're, you know, it doesn't matter how hard chips Ahoy tries unless one dude is cooking up a batch of cookies. It's not going to be like, like you making it with the original recipe, you know? I mean, I'm not, I, again, not to plug McDonald's, but, uh, I don't know if you've tried their, their freshly baked cookies, but they are pretty bomb. I'm they're kind of a cookie chip fan, cookies. So I, yeah, the McDonald's cookies yeah. are fire, bro. I mean, let's it's unbelievable. Let's be like it's four dollars for twelve cookies. Crap. I can't even believe it. We all grew up on it, and uh, they've done an, a stellar job of of uh, product integration and of quality control for what it is for fast food over a long period of time. I mean, their fries taste different. Their Coke is a different formula. Um, it is? Yeah, their Coke isn't the same formula as everybody else's Coke. It's different than Coke's actual formula. That's why McDonald's Coke tastes like McDonald's Coke. What? Yeah. Have you seen the movie The Founder? You should watch it. It's, it's amazing. I have, but I didn't. I must have missed that yeah, part. I didn't Coke, even know no, that. No, that's, I don't know if it was in there, but their Coke is actually a different formula. They have a different ratio of, of soda to, to syrup than everybody else, so that's why it is different. And they're the only hmm. ones allowed to use it. It's obviously proprietary to McDonald's. Um, they, well, I'm obsessed with their fries. They do a pretty sure. good job um, for the scale of it, once again, of how big McDonald's is, you know? I mean, I don't yeah. eat meat anymore, so they don't have any uh, vegetarian options, really. So I don't, I don't really, I, I haven't been a, a big McDonald's guy for a while. But, uh, but I mean, I grew up on it, you know, and kids want Happy mm -hmm. Meals for a reason. Their branding <laughs> is incredible. Yeah, well, you know, they say they sell, uh, they don't sell burgers and fries. They sell happiness. That's true. I mean, I you mean, know. every kid in the world wants to scream for a Happy Meal, so they're selling something. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before you know, before we end everything, you know, what what's your favorite strain? OG. Tell us what. OG. Yeah. OG Kush. OG, OG what? OG Kush is just an OG. Yeah, a solid like San Fernando Valley like OG, like the the one that we grew up on. Um, it's always going to be my favorite because it's what made us all do this kind of, you know, in a sense feel like the business wouldn't be the same without her and and uh i'll always hold her to that high respect and she's always welcome on anybody's table regardless of what they tell you but uh there's a lot of new varieties <laughs> that are cool um a lot of these new breeders like i'm a big fan of compound genetics right now they have a lot of fire coming out of their out of their breeding facilities and uh exotic genetic mike he has a lot of a lot of strains that he's been running that are really fire um a lot of the integration between the, like the production values of Los Angeles and the taste palettes of up north are coming together, and that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, for the longest time, a lot of the, I think the flower market has hurt because most of the breeders were breeding for terp profiles for hash making and not for terp profiles and flower smoking. So the guys that make flour for the consumers were limited on what they were able to, to, to have in production. Um, you know, like I said, in a greenhouse or in an outdoor facility, it's a lot easier to pheno hunt and you have a lot more space and freedom to breed and do other things. So I, I, I'm excited about what's happening. A lot of the, you know, the strong production values of a lot of these plants like GMO and wedding cakes and things that are really hardy and strong getting crossed with a lot of more flavorful uh, terpy strains. And it's, uh, it's an exciting time. I'm happy to see all of this uh, integration between different places and different sciences and uh you know it's a good time to be a smoker you know i grew up smoking like stress weed so people have it really really good right now and they have no idea you know the struggle of like seed popping blunts and and joints and like you know even when canadian chronic came around and like bc bud which was better but wasn't great definitely lacked flavor um mm -hmm. you know the nice homegrown feel that they have from the industry now is, is amazing. It's great for a consumer. And you know what's cool, Chance, is like, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, especially in LA, uh, is you're walking down the street, smoking a joint. People are like, mm. but if you're smoking a cigarette, which I don't think, I don't, you don't smoke cigarettes. No. I don't smoke cigarettes anymore either, but, but people get totally turned off by that. Oh, yeah. It's like people are far more excited about the smell of weed coming around the block oh, than yeah. they are about a, uh, you know, And it used to be the opposite. Smoke, so I mean, it used to be something that you didn't like. I know. Public. It's an amazing thing. It's, it's definitely the stigma is gone and people are open to it. And I've been doing a lot of traveling for like Sandlot type of events before COVID. And when I would be in these little small markets in like Iowa or Idaho or wherever it was, I would ask the people about it. And I would even... A lot of times we're driven around by law enforcement or local law enforcement in these small, small towns. And uh, I would ask them about it and how they feel about it. And it's definitely more receptive and coming around to, than it was when I was a child and it was completely vilified and, and you know, the devil's harvest, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see. It's funny you mentioned the devil's harvest. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the devil's harvest. I've the, got this. Do you have the poster behind you? There you go. Yeah. See it right there? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a hell of a smear campaign, you know? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. My, uh, I interviewed Dan Herrer uh, before you uh -huh. uh, last week. Oh, cool. And if you know, who da you know Dan, you know yeah. his dad's Jack. Yeah. You know, so he's, uh, he's a good buddy of mine. He's got a great story, and you know, he's extremely passionate about the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting story, um, and I can't wait for that to become one told in the future by future, future storytellers. Um, you know, you look at like, uh, you know, Drunk History and, and all of these shows that, you know, go into, you know, deep thoughts and conversations around conspiracy theories. And so I just really hope that the cannabis industry becomes a huge topic of conversation for a lot of these people because um, people need to open their eyes. And, you know, we've been lied to for a very, very long About time. About a lot of things. but Very but long the, time. The cannabis line was, was, you know, the tip of the iceberg. I mean... For somebody so uneducated as to blame it on uh, uh, like a racial profiling deal, which is what they they basically made it illegal for for industrial reasons and for patent reasons, but blamed it on yep. uh, Mexicans and black people. Exactly. Basically. There's no better way yep. to say that, but they blamed it on on African American and Latinos for for them smoking and causing ruckus or you know raping they'd say they, they, and, I mean, yep, they got beating them and super foul like just bullshit. super bullshit foul stuff and obviously the 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 uneducated whites in america at the time were you know that was an easy way for them to think that was the worst thing possible in the world and well it was because it was because that, it, they wanted the hemp mills there they, they yeah. wanted the paper mills to continue to run but then they brought then they brought wheat uh um, hemp back later on during the war because they wanted us to create, they wanted us to grow hemp for the use of creating ropes and all of these things so that, you know, of course. when we went to battle, we had all the shit we needed. It's always about so it's, what makes sense at the time. And, you know, these poor guys were persecuted for it and have been for years and years. There's still people sitting in prison for, for ludicrous amounts of time over a small amount of marijuana in a bad, in a bad location. And it's, uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the fact that, that 
the fact that even drug traffickers are treated worse than sex offenders and and uh, and murderers in some senses is is ridiculous. You know what I mean? There's been a lot of mm-hmm. heinous crimes that have been pled down to much less than a guy that was, you know, doing a friend a favor or you know handing somebody uh, um, illicit substance. You know. And yeah. These are all yeah. substances that are currently used in the medical market and have been for centuries and centuries. I mean, cannabis is in every medical journal dating back for thousands of years. And, and uh, you know, it's about time people open their eyes and figure out that this is definitely the lesser of the alcohol and tobacco, um, mm-hmm. you know, conundrum. I mean, I yep. definitely I grew up with parents that were addicted to alcohol. And it was definitely a much worse situation than being in a a, a pot smoking home. As far as I'm Shit. concerned. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't I couldn't agree. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's insane what's happening, and I'm just all at the end of the day, I'm excited to see where the industry's come, how far it's come, uh, and more importantly, where it's going. And it's because of people like us and and those I'm sure listening, who have helped, you know create transformable products, um, or who rather I should say have helped transform this industry into what it is today. I mean, um, you're an OG, I'm an OG, but one of the people that I want to give some love to is, is good old Steve D'Angelo because, yeah. you know, the last prisoner project, uh, and what he's doing to, you know, help exonerate people in prison for cannabis crimes, I think is just beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I just want to give him a shout out in the poem. Um, I met him actually at High Hopes. We did a panel together. He's a really nice guy. I was obviously uh, um, looked up to his, his uh, you know, he had one of the biggest Prop 215 cannabis businesses known to man and uh, was mm-hmm. early on a fighter for the, you know, justice of the plant. So I definitely respect and appreciate the the, the line he's led in that in that regard, you know? Yep, yep. So if anyone listening is, uh, whose phone is that? It's not mine. Oh, hold on. Sorry. It's my brother's. Um, so, <laughs> so for anyone, so for anyone who's listening, um, you know, check out the last prisoner project, go support the cause. It's, uh, for the greater good of everyone. And, um, I think at the end of the day, it only helps move the industry forward, uh, as you know, it suits, uh, you know, us as individuals, especially because there's a lot of unjust shit happening in the space and it's up to us to help make change. And if we really truly believe in the plant and we love the access we have to it, we should also all be doing everything we can to help. A hundred percent. Um, before we go, just plug my companies at foreign genetics, um, at squints on Instagram, obviously you can find, a. My podcast there, Picture Me Rolling, it's on Hayes Radio Network. Uh, <laughs> I have another hemp facility in Palm Springs that's going to be licensed and open soon, and we're going to do high-quality uh, craft hemp flower. Um, Taproot Seeds, John 707 Grows gave me some of his genetics, and then Matt at Trilogene Seeds from Colorado has given me some of his good hemp stuff, and we're going to partner on a, a really high-end quality craft uh craft hemp flower so that's that's cool i'm excited to do that that's do, dope uh, yeah i'll have to hook you up with uh my my buddies over in san diego uh pine works okay cool yeah i've uh, heard uh, they own, they have good stuff so though. pine works yeah pine you've heard of pine yeah. works cool yeah so they started so they started tree rolls um and they've got some amazing technology over there with respect to the way they pack joints um it's unlike anything else oh, really? so i'll definitely oh yeah, yeah. Me up oh, with yeah. Them. that would be great Yep, I'll definitely connect you with those guys for sure. They're great. Um, well, cool, man. I, I really, really appreciate you. I respect you a lot, and I can't thank you enough for coming on to you know, rebranding cannabis uh, to share you know, your, your story with me as it relates to Sandlot, which I'm sure you've done so many fucking times. Yeah, I have. Um, yep. Um, but uh, more importantly, I'm, I'm even more excited to have learned and heard what you're doing in the cannabis industry. I think it's great. And, and I'm excited to watch you, you know, your, grow your career in this space as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I appreciate what you're doing and getting the word out there and, and putting a face to a brand. And that's amazing. I think that people need to be familiar with, with, with the people that are involved and know that 
this isn't some big corporation or conglomerate. This is just some guys that that are trying to run a small business or operate in a space. And, and uh, it's really cool. I, I enjoy the media background of things and uh, you helping people rebrand and brand their, their products and help them in the space is, is really, you know, to, for somebody that is passionate about it and isn't just trying to get in their pockets, that's the biggest, you know, godsend we can have as a, as companies right now is that somebody's going to, you know, help them and uh, give them solid, good advice and help them navigate this space that's unfamiliar to them because, you know, a lot of people are interested. And uh, the thing that I hate the most is seeing somebody lose money to, you know, a shady character in the industry because they they were eager to get involved but but had a bad experience because of the person they chose yeah. to do, do business with. And that's that's not what I want. I want people to know that, you know, there is very hardworking, good people in the business and that we do need capital from time to time and that you should feel comfortable mm -hmm. and confident investing in these people. So thank you for letting yeah. us spread our message and uh, do our thing. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. My, my mission since I started was, has been to change the perception of cannabis on a global level, one brand at a time. Yep. And, you know, in order to do that, we have had to remain affordable. You know, we, we know we could charge a lot more money than we do, but I don't because I want to be able to touch as many people and, and brands and projects as possible. So, man, I really appreciate that. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. No, my, my pleasure. Um, I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. So. Appreciate that. Well, again, without further ado, thank you, Chauncey, for coming on to my show. Um, I, again, am a huge fan and I have a deep admiration for you and what you're doing in the cannabis industry and what you've done in your past. And um, Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to, I look forward to uh, having you on again soon, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, Jared. I, I appreciate you.